very pleased to present to you Dr. Elias Ponzi. Dr. Ponzi is a professor at the University of the Universidad de Buenos Aires, and I would say one of the foremost intellectual historians of Latin America and of Latin American political theory. So we're very pleased to have him with us today. Um, Dr. Ponzi received his licenciatura from the University of Buenos Aires and his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley where he studied with Julio Alperin. He uh, is the author of about a uh, hundred articles. Do you write in your sleep? Uh, 48 book reviews and uh, a handful, a few handfuls of books, and I'm trying to find the title of this book, so here we go. Um, on intellectual history ranging from Sarmiento to Marxism. Some of his works include uh, the, the book Aporias, Tiempo, Modernidad, Historia, Sujeto, Nación, Ley, published in Buenos Aires in 2001. Uh, la invención de una legitimidad, razón y retórica en el pensamiento mexicano del siglo XVIII, 2005. More recently, in 2007, el tiempo de la política, el siglo XIX, reconsiderado. And uh, 2009, el momento romántico, historia, nación y lenguaje políticas en Argentina del siglo XVIII. Uh, Dr. Ponzi has been the recipient of uh, many awards, including recently a Guggenheim Fellowship. He is on the editorial board of the Journal of the History of Ideas, and he has taught at a number of universities in Europe, the Americas, and the Americas. So it is a great pleasure to have him here as our second last visiting scholar of the year, and his lecture today is entitled, In the Folds of the Sacred, a Genealogy of the Political and the Hispanic World. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, I am really very glad to be here for the first time at this university. Uh, it is a pleasure to present for the first time what is going to be my next book. Uh, but I, I'd like to start telling very briefly how did the idea of this book came about. Okay, because it went further from the original project. The original project was much less ambitious, let's say. It was a part of the discussion with my colleagues in the field of Latin American history, especially in the 19th century uh, Latin American history, in the context of the bicentennial of independence. There was a huge wave of new books on independence, on the revolutions of independence, and most of them were framed within the, the general trend, which is so-called so the revisionist school, whose main representative was François Javier Garran. And basically, this revisionist school tried to counter the nationalistic view of revolution and independence as the final coming or getting of by the, the long lasting nation that finally got the right to self determination that belongs to them uh, as such a nation. Basically, what well, this revisionist school was, what was trying to show was that there was not such a thing as uh, the, the established nations before independence. 
the rising of the nations was the result of the revolution of independence and not the starting point of this process. So this was a crucial development since it opened the question about if this, the desire for self-determination was not the departure point of this process, what was that? How to understand this revolutionary process? More specifically, how we would, would we might, should try to understand is that for a man or a woman in the early 19th century to imagine another kind of government different from the monarchical government was as inconceivable as for us imagining another government different from democratic government. Uh, that, let's say for, for them the principle that sovereignty came from God was as natural and self-evident as for us the principle that sovereignty comes from the people. Well, how was that? So the revolution of independence entailed a kind of more than merely a political rapture. It entailed a, a crucial cultural watershed. Well, the, point how, the, the question is how to understand this change. Normally, the answer, well, and that's the the problem in this tradition on what I was trying to discuss. Normally, there, this rapture is explained by appealing to a rather accidental event, like the royal vacancy, the abdication by Ferdinand VII, open a uh, power vacuum and this triggered the revolution of independence. But that for me was not a, a valid explanation. Because well actually the dynastic uh, problems were in, in the past too. For example, uh, during the uh, Seven Year War in, in, at the end of the 17th century, there were in Spain three different kings struggling among them for succession. And, and at that moment, nobody thought in Latin America to get independent. It, it was clear that something happened in the intervening year that, is, that may explain why the same events now lead a completely different result. Well, that was the other the basic point for this presentation. What I want to try to, to present now is exactly what what was what happened between the 16th century and the 18th, the end of the 16th century, what changing change in the meantime that opened or paved the way for the, the idea or the break of the monarchic uh, regime of government. And basically what, what was, what emerged at that moment, and well, that was the result of my research, and not the starting point. My starting point was basically trying to 
device, the revision is due. Well, the revision is due is, well, the main, the main, the leading idea of this school is, let's say, the moral from traditional to modern, to modernity, from traditionality to modernity, let's say. Independence marks the, the turning point from tradition to modernity. But actually, the problem I saw in this, this, this explanation is it gives a rather flat picture for both the pre-modern time and the modern time, as, as if the only one, only single virtue of break in the whole his, modern history was that that took place at that moment. And all that comes before the 1800 is labeled or grouped together under the big umbrella of tradition. And all that comes after that is grouped together under the label of modernity. And when it discards beforehand the possibility of other fresh historical breaks uh, before 1800 and after 1800. Well, the, the crucial point is if we don't break this rather flat view of the preceding years, we cannot understand how revolution independence finally took place or could have happened. Somehow the, there was a, a series of changes in the preceding years that eventually paved the way for this new <coughs> development of a very different regime of government and a republic and form of government. But that's what I, I am trying to present today. I like to show what changes, especially during the 17th century, and basically how was that the polit political or politics in the West finally emerged. The crucial break would allow us to understand why the revolution took place was that what came for the first time in the West was politics. That, that politics is not that the political, it's not an external category, but it was the result of, a, of an inclusion inflation that took place during the period which spanned from 1650 through the 1750. That is roughly the Baroque period. On Friday, we are going to see the next part of this presentation, how the series of changes occurred during this period will finally produce the, the kind of political play that occurred in the So this is only a, a first part of the story. And more concretely, they, I, it is what I call the epidemiology of the political. How was the, that inflation took place? Well, to understand that, that inflation, we should go back and to see very, very briefly the reception of the politics, Aristotle's poly, politics in the West. Because the whole political debate was framed within the old theory of the forms of government. Even until the 19th century, during the revolution of independence, the, the main 
discussion was what kind or what form of government was well suited to each kind of nation. That was the legacy of, of the old theory of forms of government. The, poli the, the politics by Aristotle was translated in the 13th century, in 1269, by Jean William of Morgan, who would, uh, it was uh, translate, translated on behalf of uh, Aquinas, from Aquinas. And Aquinas was the first to comment, to make the commentaries to the to Aristotle's text. And he said the terms of the debate, of political debates from then on, with his commentary. But the first point, what, what is it? What I like to underline here about this is that in in the ancient world, the term politics is somehow tricky. There is no really a political concept in the ancient times. Let them, the term politics was the opposite to oikonomia. Oikonomia refers to private goods. While the politics refers to public goods. That's it, that word is common to all. Perhaps a, a better time to translate it term of <coughs> politics should be, let's say, rather than the, the political is the social, what is common to all. What was not conceivable in ancient times was the opposition between the political and the social. And this is expressed in this text in the fact that Monarchy has no place in, in this period. According to Aristotle, the best form of government was the so-called politeia, which later would be translated as republic, and which was a mixture of aristocracy and democracy. What was that so important? because the whole art of government was trying to balance social interests, to, to reach a balance between the poor and the rich in order to avoid controversy and struggle. So, in this framework, monarchy has no place in monarchy did not represent any social interest. Actually, for Aristotle, monarchy was not the proper form of government, but just a version of aristocracy. When this radically changed in the 13th and 14th century, when this text was translated into Latin. At that moment, there were, it was taking place, place a series of changes in the regime of government. So if we don't observe these changes, if, you, if you, we don't take into account these changes, we cannot understand how the revolution of independence could take, take place. When scholasticism 
was linked when Aquinas recovers Aristotle actually when he, he makes a kind of operation upon Aristotle's idea the, the big problem the big theological problem that Aquinas was trying to solve was how was that a god placing place outside, above, and outside the world could operate within the world. That was the Trinitarian and mysterious God Father and God and, and the Son, the God who is, was made a man. The problem of the oikon, precisely of, of the divine oikon, the right distribution, oikon of the right distribution of things, or disposition of things. Well, Aristotle's, uh, Aquinas takes Aristotle's idea of nature in order to explain this, this phenomenon, taking the theolog theological idea of nature of Aristotle, that God inscribed his design within things themselves, in their nature. They, his goal were part of the very nature of the things. That they try, well, this is a, a big, a, well, separation between the first causes and the secondary causes. The first causes operate was when God in, operated immediately over things. And the secondary causes is what, the ways that God operated through his intermediary agent. In the realm of politics, the agent was the king who incarnated in the world the idea of unicity, the oneness of, of God in, in, in the universe and the Father in the household. Well, there is, as, as, as I was saying, the development of scholasticism has to do with uh, changing the regime of power in the West when in the 13th and the 14th century there is a transition from the old feudal monarchy to the corporatist monarchy. You, the feudal monarchies, there was a kind of linear continuity between society uh, and, and the heads, which was in the, let's say, the king was nothing but the linear emanation of a system of subordination which were present in society itself. Well, you know that lords have their vassals. But in turn, lords were vassals of a superior lord and so on. There was a pyramid of hierarchy, hierarchy in which it was the king. But the nature of the power of the king regarding their vassal was not very really different in nature from the kind of relationship of the Lord with the apostles and, and so on. Actually, Marquis, Scar, um, Castro, and etc. kept full independence with it, total dominion on their territory, some of which were even larger than those of the king himself. Well, that was 
change at that moment. In the, at the end of the 13th century and the 14th century, monarchy, we can see how the monarchy starts being in a different relationship with their subjects, which when the relationship between the king and the subject was of a different nature of that among the subject themselves. And that was would appear from here I mean, in a series of writing. I can not have all the quotation now or I won't get the point again. But the meaning is that the function of the king was to establish justice. Justice is the, the divine principle. It, it is linked to the idea that, that there is a, a plan of creation in which everything has its proper place, and the, the king must do king every group, every social group, in order to harmonize them mutually and constitute uh, a whole integrated body, social body. That's the idea of justice. But, well, this is linked in turn to the idea that there is not the one single law, but many different sources of normativity, of legality. Everybody in society has its, its own laws. It could develop their own norm. And the king has to have much of the harmonized plural normativity in order to integrate Well, the basic idea that's clearly stated by Dante, who was a, a contradictor of Aquinas, because Aquinas, well, there was the times in the struggle between papas, the papas and uh, the emperor. Uh, Aquinas, of course, supported the cause of the Pope, the Pope and Dante was given in supporting the, the rights of the emperor over the public. And what he stated is that the, well, this, the one who, uh, who provides justice, who dispenses justice to society, cannot be a part of that society. Nobody can be a part and a judge at the same time. So the king, as a dispensator of justice, should be placed in a different position, at the same time internal and external society. Actually, this, this was placed in a kind of interstitial position, in the vortex that articulates the different body among them. Well, neo-scholasticism, which is the other, what, what I, uh, I like to see here, the Baroque period, this, this what was seen was the transition from the feudal world to the Renaissance. When neo the Renaissance which was linked to the idea, as I told you, of central, the first centralized monarchy, and also the emergence of the modern uh, courts and parliament, in which the different bodies of society were re represented. This is, this is also a traditional motif. The elevation of the soul, seeking this his final reunion with God. However, 
discontinuity, you can see here, was broken here. There is no way of communication between the low and the high. Between, between the superior and the mundane world, the world of value and the world of passion. And this is expressed to, in two different logics which organize the two parts of the picture, uh, which is part of, a part of the well-known tendency by a Greek to bend figures. You know, he was interpreted as a precursor for Modinia and for that. that. But if you can observe, figures are stretch, but the kind of stretching is very different in, in both parts. In the lower part, figures are bent down, down, downward for the weight of the material body. Instead, in the upper part of the picture, they bend to upside, seeking to finally join to God. But, uh, in any case, well, we can see there is no way of observe from the lower part to God. The proliferation of figures, which is the typical Mayerist uh, technique of the Baroque, prevents any direct communication between the two parts. And that's when the, the fundamental figure of the picture appears. Huh? This is this one, which is the priest who is beside in the, uh, the sacrament. You can see how this figure reproduces in his garment the folds of the sacrament which are in God, and also in the shroud, which is going to receive the soul of the cow. Well, now, this is the fundamental figure that he has appeared, who is the figure of the mediator. Once direct communication is broken between the realm of justice, of value, and the realm the moon and the world, the realm of, of the law, of the state of poly. The only way to reestablish the communication is through the intercession of a mediator figure, a third term, who can reestablish the link. Actually, he is the only one who can look at God and observe. In order to establish the communication, he has to separate himself from the quotation. Well, this, this is the Trinitarian figure between the Godfather and their always imperfect incarnation in the world. They are must appear the third part of the Holy Spirit in the Trinitarian mystery, who can reunite the three into one single substance. Well, we are going to see that the other problem is, well, this, this figure, the, the mediator, is the new figure that appears now, in, in, and is the one which will condense the dramatic core of policy. This is going to be the which incarnates the problematic aspect which emerges with the rising of the And that's what we are going to see now regarding in connection with the text by Nancy Pozoari. 
the other problematic figure is the, the X1. And we, we are going to talk about it. Okay. Let's say first, tell this structure is reproduced now in the realm of politics, more specifically in the realm of political science. Well, what was that? What we saw here, Francisco Suárez. Francisco Suárez was the last and most important representative of the Salamanca School. Salamanca at that moment, the University of Salamanca was the cultural center of the world. And, um, Suárez was probably the most important thinker before Hobbes and Locke and the other tradition, and he was very well known at that time. That would, later it was forgotten because he very Catholic view, and that was somehow out of fashion, they say. But at that moment, all philosophers discussed with Suarez, including Hobbes. Hobbes called Suarez in the uh, well, what, what, and this text in particular I, I, I'm going to speak about was very, very important because it is the defense of evil, the defense of faith, which was written uh, and, and was asked to be written by Cardinal Villarino. Bellarmino, who was the one who condemned Galileo in the, in the context of the struggle between the papacy and the new Protestant king. And actually, it was intended as an answer to a speech by James I in England which, who, in which he elaborated the thesis, the first elaboration of the modern thesis, or the sovereignty came to the kings, was conferred upon the king by God himself. And that's why Suarez is better known, because again, this Theory, the papacy uh, supported the idea that sovereignty came to, the, came to the community and the community transferred sovereignty to the king. That was the first Suarez, this book by Suarez was the first elaboration of a modern idea of a social pact, a social contract. Many people quote Suarez like a far antecedent of Rousseau. That's actually an anachronistic, but as we we're going to see, it is really very important Suarez thinking, but not exactly for this one, for this idea of the social contract. We, we should try to, to, to discover the importance of, of Suarez with mass. When actually this book was burned in Paris and London because it was considered heretic because of the point that it had an attitude 
consequences. King thought his community from her sovereignty to the king, they can withdraw sovereignty at any moment, and there was no possibility of establishing any regular power. Well, the, the discussion first had the form, took the form of a kind of epistemology. The first argument again, it again changed the first, was that take the first step in order to reject the papacy, the subordination to the papacy, that the sacred text, God's word is written in sacred text, so everybody can make use of them natural reason in order to understand God's design. And when what was Suarez was argued against this position by him was that first Actually, this was, an, uh, this has an actual consequence in the sense that I, I ultimately changed this code was self-contradictory since he defined the big thing as possible any criterion of authority. And he forced me to self-contradict to understand me that he had no if on the one hand he didn't accept the Puritan reading of the, of the Bible but he now this, this is whole book the Basilicon Ronon by James the first was an attack to the Puritans who were condemning James the first. When the whole discussion was about the experience side, it, it was right to kill a king which was a heretic. And the Jesuits actually supported that idea. Actually, there is a book by Juan de Mariana which discuss the best way for a Catholic to kill a king by poison or sign, etc. Well, the point is that the Puritans question James' legitimacy, but according to Suarez, if, if we don't have any authority, if everybody can use, can make use of his natural reason to interpret the sacred text, there is no way to impose his own reading of the Bible upon those who don't accept it. He might, so he forced into self-contradiction because he needs a criterion of authority which, but without having now any basis on which what, where to find his own authority. But he still needs it. But and actually there is another even more serious contradiction in, in so far as he says that he makes use well he, he wants to grasp through his natural reason the truth which is contained in this text but he 
he actually uh, already assumes that this faith contains the truth. This is not the result of the, the use of natural reason, but the, but the premise of it. If you want to use this natural reason to understand it, it's because you have faith in that this takes place on this day. So reason is not the premise, but yeah, reason is not the premise, but the result, the consequence of faith. It cannot, he, he doesn't deny the use of reason, but it can only be operative within the framework of a faith which precedes, precedes reason. So this is, the, again, the Trinitarian Between the plurality of opinions, and the singularity of truth, there is, it is necessary to interpose a third term which can lead from one to the other, which is, in this case, the, the third term, the aging, the intermediary aging, is faith. Hmm? Otherwise, there is no way if someone say one thing and another say another thing, there is no way of solving the question. There is no immediate communication, I use the picture by the Greek, between opinion and truth. There is no way by, from, to have access from the realm of opinions which are plural by definition to the realm of truth which are, is one and singular by, the, by definition. Mm. Well, this is reproduced in the <coughs> realm of policy, that's a good epistemology, but in the realm of more specifically, which is the political level, follow the same, the same thing. The whole thinking, the scholastic thinking, is a, is a sort of dualism and at the same time of mediation. Between, between God and the being, the, between the super terrenal power and the earthly power, there is a mediator. And that mediator, the agent, in this case, is the community. The community is the one which confers upon them in sovereignty, which comes in, in the end from God. Well, that, in this case, from even if it works, not, it is not really a sociological. Does not refer to any social reality. It is just a political principle, which is the political principle that communities incarnate is in a kind of excess of sovereignty with respect to the body of the sovereign. Sovereignty. Well, there is a kind of limit between the case that which the king does not, cannot trespass without turning into its opposite, the tyrant. It, it simply delimits this excess of sovereignty with respect to the body of the sovereign. I forgot to tell you. This dualism is closely tied to, for those who know that book by The King's Two Volumes by Kantorovic, that you heard of that, that Kantorovic has a book with, in which he shows that the English Revolution was produced under the motive of the King's Two Volumes. That 
actually the Puritans kill the kill the king, but they say they said that they were not against monarchy, the mystical body of the king, but the investiture, but rather the early body, the mortal body, which was in contradiction with his mystical body. There was a, that was what, according to Kasparovi, was expressed in Shakespeare's tragedy. The impossibility of matching this. Now, the split between his dual nature. And this is also the, the problem of this mediator figure. It has the dual nature. It is, at the same time, sacred and profane. Uh, but in a moment in which these two worlds broke any communication, he will incarnate also this decision. This will, this will become interior of the figure of the mediator between these two bodies, the sacred body and the mortal body. Well, James the first said that uh, Suarez's argument was anarchic in the sense that he made it possible the establishment of any political power. Really the political power. Well, what was the answer? I haven't finished here, so I, I took too long. What was the answer by Suarez to this argument by James the first? That what he said that first that well he provided two arguments. The first one is the best known of them, which he developed in another unbelievable or long a treatise or long, in which he said that <coughs> once sovereignty was transferred to that monarch, it couldn't be withdrawn. But it is not clear why people cannot withdraw sovereignty to the king. Actually, well, this, this is the basic problem with the very concept of sovereignty. Let's say, uh, sovereignty, once it is transferred, cannot be taken up. And why it, it cannot be taken up? Well, this is the second argument. So it, it is clear that under the second argument, they normally finish by the student of Suarez is extensive, and which is the crucial one. The crucial argument is that the problem, well, what he says is uh, that the community, well, that the community conferred to the king sovereignty means that God did not expect in unity any singular person to bear sovereignty. We have the clear the distinction between primary concepts and secondary concepts. In the realm of primary concepts, the result is inscribed in the thing itself in its very nature. The thing cannot be otherwise. The contrary is a contrary. But this is not so in the realm of secondary causes, in which there is um, it is a state of laxity. In the in fact, for Suarez, he got invested with sovereignty in his person in particular, not, and even he didn't say that monarchy is, is the only form of co government which was possible. Actually, as Aristotle said, there were different forms of government, possible government. So between God's design, the primary concept, 
and its effect in the realm of secondary causes. There is, if it's necessary, yeah, M18, M18 will link the primary design and its concrete manifestation. In this case, the community who has to decide who is going to bear the, the, the effect, no? the crown. But it is not the disposition by God, but, but the community. But the other point is that that community is not the, the community itself does not precede the investment of the sovereignty upon the king. The real problem that that's what is trying is trying to highlight is sovereignty does not belong to the, the person of the king. He's only the person who is an actor and representative of something which exceeds his own privilege. And he can use his power for his own sake, but from the community's sake. Okay, but no particular also is invested with sovereignty. The real problem is not, the real problem is not if communities can withdraw sovereignty to the king once he turns into a tyrant. Because the very figure of tyrant, tyrant involves legitimacy. In, the, in that case, it's perfectly, perfectly legitimate to rise to rebel against the king. Then the first thing, even since the, the first thing has changed. The real question was, who is going to decide when the king turns into a tyrant? Who can speak on behalf of the whole community? And the only one who can speak on behalf of the whole community is the very king. Because the king and community are created at the same moment. There is no community without a king. What we have is just a multitude plurality of scattered individuals. Only there is a true community at the moment in which there appears a center of authority around which this plurality of beings can coalesce. So what does, what does it mean? The same way that we, we have here again the Pranatana mystery. Now what we have is that. The, the king works as the intermediary agent which joins together the plural, well, the famous victim with the plurius mm -hmm. who can proceed the transition for, from the plurality of individuals into the singularity of community. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what do we get? And, and, and that marks the fundamental break, the emergence of the political. That the constitution of community is, the, is not the result of, is not produced by community itself, but the principle which provides its unity to community outside outside community itself. This outside of community 
which constitute community itself is precisely the work of the political. That's completely new. That's a new development of the 17th century, and that's the, the, the core and the problematic core which we traverse the whole political thinking up to the today. This is, as, as I said, what the sovereignty now, which is in, in modern term, the figure of the agent will change. At that moment was the king, later will be congresses or parliaments or the law for reason or history. In different moments, different figures will occupy the place of the mediator. But this is also which, as I, I, I said, will incarnate a traumatic or, or, or it is a concept of sovereignty has this ambiguity in the sense that all political concepts, what makes political concepts, political concepts, is this, and that's what we are going to see in the work, is this apoetic nature. That are on inherently problematic in the sense that, not that they are, like normally they are my sort of concept, but democracy or <coughs> freedom or justice. They are inherently problematic, not in the sense that they are, let's say, too good to be true. That an unfeasible concept, in the sense that we can only approach them progressively without never reaching them, we say. Good in theory, but irrealistic. Can be approached as a topical But rather that they are inherently self contradictory in the sense that when they are balanced, they destroy themselves. The question is the very question is what was Suarez saying? Can we put limits to the monarch? Does the monarch have limits or not? Can we place a limit to the monarch? Or not? And the answer is yes and no. And both things at the same time in, in the same way. The concept of sovereignty says this is the apoia of the concept of sovereignty. On the, on the one hand, imposed or is, is contradictory with the, with the idea of a, of a limit. Because if we place a limit to the sovereign, it entails that there is someone who may judge him. So he's not really a sovereign. If I can't judge the sovereign, the sovereign is mean of it. No. Mm -hmm. But at the, so it, it cannot accept a, a limit without destroying it. But at the same time, it demands a limit. Otherwise, there is no legitimate sovereign. If the sovereign can do whatever he wants, it's not, he, he becomes indistinguishable of his over, he's a tyrant. So the figure of the sovereign at the same time demands and includes the idea of a limitation. So the concept of sovereignty and social pact or social contract are born together and they <coughs> refer mutually to each other. 
At least this would explain its dynamic to this new field, which is the field of the, poli of the political that at that moment matters. Okay. What emerged that is a field which is stretched, with torn between two extremes. On one, on the one hand, the of excess of community of sovereignty with regard to the king, and on the other hand, the excess of the sovereign with regard to community. Sovereignty, the sovereign is in a relationship of excess with regard to the community in it, it, it provides the principle of community which constitutes a community as such. And on the other hand, community is in a, in a relationship of excess with regard to the sovereign since it marks all of that, the destiny, all of that of sovereignty that so the, is not at the disposal of the king. That he cannot violate without damage into its opposite design. Right? So the field of the politics is the, the field which stretches between these double extremes. Well, I really know who you are, yes? Time we, we can follow the story. This is only provision, and I spoke this story. So, do we have time for questions? Oh, so I forgot to ask. When I refer to it, it will be very brief. This actually is lateral to this part of the speech, but I like to mention just because I, I spoke about it. Uh, this is, this is um, a Greco's song. Okay. And this is an, an interesting because he's the other figure of the movie. Because one of the that appeared at one moment was also the problem of representation. Okay. It, is also, it is also the time that when Foucault, that Foucault speaks about you know, words and things, and that was translated as the other thing. Okay. That words cut their tie with the thing that they define. awareness about the conventionality and, and artistic character of language. But uh, up to that moment, it was thought that the essence of the thing was contained in the name. Characters in, in literary works of the period were had the name of prudence, virtue, and they contained already the, the nature of the character. When that was the period in which the edge of the repetition, which in Spain in particular was particularly psychoanalytic, that's the Spain uh, which started this long decline after losing their colonies to Europe. <coughs> Uh, well, the, the second part of the Golden Age is, is clearly marked because for this uh, awareness of the conven conventional nature of our way of representing the world. Well, this figure is the mediator figure. Well, this is a reference to the very problem of representation within the system of representation. He's the only figure who is looking at that, to the observer. He's an intermediary figure between the internal and the external, the inner part of the, the picture and the outer, 
the outside of the picture. And well, he's, it is funny that he is a kid who is completely ignorant of what's going on behind his, his back. He was playing, in, this is a cosmological camera, which is, which is a pile in there. And he's completely ignorant and he's throwing play there. And this figure is the only one who is ignorant of him. He's the one who is uh, the only one who looks at us and invites us to look at the, what is going on there. With the hand, he makes a gesture trying to present it. And when I draw, you cannot observe that. But if you look at the eyes of the kid, the whole dramatic tone of the picture will immediately dissolve. We lose their sense, the tragic content of the picture is dissolved in his, in his eyes. That's the way one. As I said, he, he's the hero and the mediator who is at the, who at the same time that decides us to see what is going on, the dramatic sense of the same, and at the same time show us the artificiality of the system of representation, that there is not a real drama here. It's, it's only a representation. Like the king is the representative of the public that expects to see himself. And there is no natural incarnation for this power between the representative and that which it represents. There is no immediate communication. It is the representative link is established only in the rank of artists. It's a convention, I say, but the king is not really a king. We accept, take him as a king. Well, that, that was the Shakespeare, the piece. Shakespeare tragedy. Explain and show in the most dramatic. Thank 
con mi gente sobran, para que cobran, que no antes sobran, también cobran ahora, por tanto, con su derecho no estoy. Anarcho de ti, moro, lo más de ti, lo más de ti, ves, que te pasa con la mano, es más, condition for the this this was not the only a philosophical only at that moment even for for this kind of subject it was possible for them to appear a new object of reality which is the government as as different from sovereignty the government was different from the, between the, the practice of power and the being of power, the essence, the foundation of power. Mm -hmm. In those terms, there is no communication. The foundation of power relates to super terrenal principles, superior principles. The practice of power now was a conventional thing, and for that reason, accepted different opinions. So, uh, and, and that was the condition of possibility for the marking of a new object of reality, the government, and that was linked in turn to the development of, of a state apparatus. So actually, Spain was the first uh, region which developed a true state apparatus, the bureaucracy. The term bureaucracy dates from the, the beginning of the 18th century. We can find in text of the time the word bureaucracy. The first, well, the, there was a huge army of officials. demanded in terms of a very well-established administration. And that was, but the, the fundamental point is that the principle that to which government, administration, the minister, the son, and the sovereign, they refer to two completely different laws. Well, uh, I think that that same sentence that we could hear in the rebellion to revolt that liberal brain more and mal gobierno, and mal gobierno here doesn't mean, or I don't think that they understood as a separate entity from the sovereign. Actually, the mal, the mal gobierno referred to all those royal officials uh, who were appointed by the king, and these royal officials were actually seen or understood as the servants of the king, manifestations of the power of the king, or to use the language of the period, they were the, the images of the king. So in that sense, I don't think that we can separate uh, this no, phrase we, mal gobierno, we. government. Uh, it's, 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 this, this gobierno is a, is a form of, go, uh, of, of governing, literally, rather than the notion, the modern notion of government as a separate entity. But that, that the the answer to the, those, well, we are going to, uh, discussed in the next week, a text by Joaquin de Finestra, who was uh, brought to the by by Lexi to the to the kingdom of Nuevo Granay uh, after the Comunero Religio. And she said exactly what you said. And you were completely crazy. 
Transformation which preceded the revolution of independence 
So that that's why I think that in this this video the, the Spanish word is very telling of this phenomenon. How the theological, eschatological universe could provide the basis for a for a kind of thinking of, of conceiving of society which is, which was at the same time completely contradictory with this universe. This twist, this kind of inflection is what I am trying to understand here. Mm -hmm. How a more philosophic theological became political. And how this peculiar phenomenon took place. And I think that as, as we can see here, there is no um, abandonment of the theological, but rather than the, the premise for the notion of the political was paradoxically the result of an exacerbation of the theological. The same way that the absolutist monarchy set the premises that eventually would lead to its own destruction. That's true that in the meantime, the revolutionaries will have to produce an operation of this category, and they will take this theological, political category, but they will give to them completely different meaning. In order to produce this impression to turn this category against monarchy itself. But that's the new practice of the name. What I, I, I was trying to see now was how this, more specifically this, how theological became political. Now this set a new terrain the new terrain in which all political debate in the future will take place. We cannot understand political debate if we, not, if we don't place first within this new terrain what the margin of concept like sovereignty or democracy, etc. have emerged. And, and ultimately, problematic cause that underlies this concept. Democracy is not one. Well, that, that's the topic. But concepts like democracy, etc., do not refer to any reality, to any con set of premises or policy but basically this represents a problem, actually an unsolvable problem, contradictory problem, which is the problem of popular sovereignty. How the concept of sovereignty gave rise to the concept of popular sovereignty, which is actually an oxymoron, a contradiction in two terms. If there are sovereigns, it's because there are subjects. I find the same for subjects and be sovereign and in the same premise, so it's absurd. We don't think about it simply because we heard of it since we were born. But if we retain that, it does not um, that, that has no other foundation rather than a historical concept which established and naturalized this concept into our political life. So we, the work of an intellectual historian is unbarred the process from which this category finally became naturalized in our own political life. Well, that's the topic of 